couple of symbols that I wanted to point out to you after you have finished reading chapter one. One of them is the kiss. Now this kiss sits in Mrs. Darling's corner of her mouth right there, and as it's described, uh, Mr. Darling, it's talking about the relationship she had with Mr. Darling and how Mr. Darling was able to get every bit of her except for that little kiss that sits in the corner of her mouth. He got all of her except the innermost box and the kiss. He never knew about the box and in time he gave up trying for the kiss. So this kiss that kind of sits in the corner of her mouth is kind of an awkward, kind of weird symbol I suppose, but I want you to keep an eye on it because I think it represents something that James Berry particularly values in adults that are as well adjusted as Mrs. Darling. Mrs. Darling seems to be a very kind and generous woman who likes to play still and has her dreams still, but is also very grown up. So if Mrs. Darling is kind of the representation of successful adulthood, then we need to keep an eye on what she does with this kiss and why she's keeping it and what it's for. The other thing I wanted to point out that's even more important is the description that the, that the first chapter gives on what Neverland is. Now, just to make it clear, Disney got it wrong. It's not Never Neverland. It's just Neverland. So, as the book describes it, this is what Neverland looks like. They say that it's a map of a child's mind, which I think is particularly interesting because then it shows us how Neverland is created by the minds of the people who want to go there and how that then reflects what their wants and desires and needs are as a character. And you'll see that in just a little bit. Um, it says the Neverland is always more or less an island with astonishing splashes of color here and there and coral reefs and a rakish looking craft in the offing and savages and lonely lairs and gnomes who are mostly tailors and caves through which a river runs and princes with six elder brothers and a hunt going uh, fast going to decay. So if Neverland is a map of a child's mind and there are lots of adventures and a lot of kind of exotic experiences to be had. It talks about how Neverland's very a good deal. It says John's, for instance, has a lagoon with flamingos flying over it, at which John is shooting. Uh, while Michael, who was very small, had a flamingo with lagoons flying over it. John lived in a boat turned upside down on the sands, Michael in a wigwam. Wendy in a house of leaves deftly sewn together. John had no friends. Michael had friends at night. Wendy had a pet wolf forsaken by its parents. So we see very quickly here two of the things that Wendy values most. One of those things is having a house of her own. So Wendy likes to pretend at growing up. She likes to have something that, that makes her feel like a woman, makes her feel more responsible. She also, you'll notice, has that pet wolf that's been forsaken by its parents. So that could mean a couple of different things. It could be that she feels forsaken by her parents and would like to have somebody take care of her, um, particularly as you see her relationship with her dad is a little bit awkward. Or it could just be that Wendy values taking care of something that needs her, and you see that in her relationship with Peter. So Wendy's Neverland is definitely kind of a projection of the things that she values most, the things that she likes, the things that she's afraid of, and the things that she is that, that she kind of that she holds most close. Um, you see that a little later too, as well as she talks about how Peter features very prominently in her Neverland, which concerns her mother a little bit. All right, I think that's everything I had for you, except for you to keep an eye on how Wendy's idea of Neverland and the things that she wants shows up in her actual experience in Neverland, because they come very close.